Hi. Well, um, my name is Silvano Cirujano Cuesta. Uh, you can call me Silvano. It's easier. <laughs> and I'm going to give a presentation about um, firmware updates for IoT-like projects. I'm a software engineer at Siemens. I work for uh, corporate technology. Corporate technology is the um, corpor corporate central technical unit. And I'm part of the Embedded Linux Corporate Competence Center. Uh, we are a team with a lot of open source software contributions with um, people. We have four speakers in this event. And um, yeah, apart from that, uh, I'm interested on not only on firmware updates, software updates in general, but also on um, trying to give bring the embedded devices to write the containers wave. Well, and let's see, the, this is the agenda for today. Why updating a, an overview of the architecture, the components involved into this solution, and how the firmware updates are done, and a conclusion. So um, I have. Here, down here, you can see where we are, which is each slide. So I would like to, to present. It's an um, open source software for a solution for firmware updates, remotely controlled. So that's why IoT-like projects. And I would like to present what we, um, this, this, this solution. But also, I would like to show uh, um, to show a success story of a contribution from the company into open source software projects. So, right now, into in the industrial domain, we have typically devices that are not connected or in isolated domains, and there are quite often on-site updates, just with a USB stick, for example. Uh, some of these devices have um, really long um, life. Sometimes they are difficult to reach. For example, this wind, um, wind um, power generation offshore um, devices. And typically, they don't get that often updates. But the Internet of Things is also coming to industrial domains. So. Um, the trend is showing that devices are getting more and more connected, industrial products in industrial domains, and the number of devices getting connect, connected is exploding. It's exploding. It means that you cannot any longer manually update each one of them, so you need to, to remotely manage, uh, update remotely manage. Um, on the other side, we have there is an increase on the on the attack surface due to the network connectivity that we have. So we need more software updates in order to fix those security issues. Of course, there is always a back to fix. And um, we have in industrial domains, people are have a, a big exposure to technology, smartphones, a tablet. IoT at home, and they have some expectations also for industrial devices, like that it's easy to update the devices to get new features and uh, to fix bugs. So in the end, there is a good reason for updates. Sorry, I didn't say it yet. Uh, just if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Just interrupt, interrupt me. So when we started um, working on this solution, we were looking for open source software components to get remotely managed firmware updates. We identified two open source software projects, Hogbit for the backend and SW update for the devices, uh, but they were kind of disconnected. So they were not connection between both projects. If you attended the previous presentation from uh, Matt Porter, you already saw a spoiler. So um, we contributed to 
SLU update, what we call Suricata, that was an, ex an extension to SLU update to create a connection with Hogbit so that you can manage the updates on the devices from the backend. Okay, let's see um, the workflow. I don't know, it's too small. Um, sorry. <laughs> well, uh, anyway, I will it's explain, I will explain all the steps. So uh, we have first the devices are polling. This is, there are many different possible implementations. So that's, I'm showing the one that we implemented. Uh, in this solution, the devices are polling, requesting for artifacts, firmware updates, and the backend replies either with a no updates available or with a list of uh, updates with download URLs. In the case of firmware updates, typically just one artifact, just a download. So when we get um, firmware to install, then the device has received already download URLs, well, the one URL, and will contact either Hogbit, or we could also use another uh, artifact repository. Anyway, um, repository where the firmware is and will download the updates. It will then process the update, update the firmware, and it will report back to Hogbit if it's been successful or not. So that's a typical update workflow. Okay, let's see the components that we integrated into there. We have uh, SW update. At that time, uh, we couldn't find neither open source software nor commercial alternatives uh, to SW update back then. So at that point, we had to make a decision, make versus buy open source software. So we evaluated SW update. Um, it's open source software. It's developed by a well-established player in the open source software uh, community like the uh, company Tanks. They are the uh, maintainers of the U-Bot, the well-known bootloader, and they have experience in industrial domains. If that wasn't convincing enough, um, we had really um, convincing feature set like, uh, well, SW update uses the running Linux system, the, the Linux user space to do the updates. So you have the full power of a, of a Linux user space against bootloader updates. It's extensible and it has a good integration with the mostly used uh, bootloader, at least what we find the mostly used uh, bootloader U-Bot, but it also supports uh, or offers possibilities to extend to other bootloaders. Um, it's bottle-proof software. The Stefano has been already using the software for um, their projects. So in the end, it was for us an easy decision for buy the open source software project. The backend component, Hogbit, Okay, we also look for, uh, for possible solutions and we couldn't find any convincing alternatives to it, neither open source software nor commercial. So we faced again a make versus buy decision. Um, this software was developed originally by Bosch Software Innovation and was released as open source software under the umbrella of the IoT Working Group of the Eclipse Foundation. Um, it's written in Java using the Supreme framework, so it's kind of for us a embedded, kind of a strange um, domain, so to say. Um, for us, it was also convincing that that Bosch is also in the industrial domain as Siemens. Um, it has it has also a convincing set of features, not only present features, but also they are working on future features. They are really interesting for us. For us, it was important to be able to 
shift from device managed provisioning to remote managed provisioning. So the backend decides when R can get the devices the updates. In the end, the devices can decide that by themselves if they want to, to update or not. But first is the backend deciding if it provides the, 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 the updates or not. It's easy to integrate with other backend um, services due to REST APIs, well documented REST APIs. It offers the possibility of connecting directly um, to Hogbit or indirectly using uh, message queues. It also supports um, external artifacts repository, so these both two are important if you have a lot of devices and you don't want to put too much load into um, Hogbit. And well, this project is kind of young project and it's still working on some stabilization and adding some new features. But nevertheless, as I said, we couldn't find any convincing alternatives. So we also decided to buy this open source software component. So these are the two components that we uh, integrated. Um, I have to say that thanks to both projects because we were happy with what we uh, got there. And let me get into the details. So let me try to define, kind of define what I mean with firmware updates. So I'm talking about the base system that makes your system runnable without bootloader and with the kernel included into the firmware and with possibly other partitions with applications, configurations, whatever. So we, we see um, two extremes in the possible update strategies that there are in an IoT domain and between them you have a kind of a, tra or there is a trade-off between time, so application downtime, and space, uh, storage space that you need for your images. So one of the extremes is one firmware um, partition and the other one is two firmware partitions. If you have one firmware partition, you have the worst downtime, uh, application downtime. If you have but the, the best uh, storage space, so you require less. But if you have two firmware partitions, then you have the best application downtime, but the worst storage space. It's also possible to kind of get hybrid solutions by reducing the firmware. But if you reduce the firmware enough, you would get almost to the situation where you're having almost the same storage footprint in both cases. So then you would decide for the two firmware partitions due to uh, application downtime. Let's see the two firmware partitions. That's, in our opinion, the preferred strategy if you can afford it. So um, with this strategy, you can you um, can avoid breaking your device in a sense of losing connection from the backend to the device. And it offers a rollback possibility, one version backwards. Um, well, the colors are kind of strange looking here, but um, I prefer to use, instead of the typical um, firmware one, two, or A, B, there is the uh, green-blue deployment um, pattern, and this should be blue, and this should be green. <laughs> so the idea is that both firmware partitions are equivalent. You can start any of them. You, you will have different versions, but they are equivalent. There, there is no difference between them. If you would install the same version, then it would be the same no matter which one you start. And in this um, strategy, you have short downtime 
application downtime just during the reboot of the system. Uh, another advantage of this strategy is that you can you can cancel an update due to uh, manipulation in the firmware image or um, an error in the download of the image or for whatever reasons without losing a working version. So the previous, you would get a rollback to the previous working version. Let's have a look at the update itself, the process. So SW update would be pulling the, the backend asking for updates, and then Hogbit would reply, okay, here you can get your firmware update. We're running this firmware version, bootloader is configured to start it. And then um, SW update will start the download from, the, from Hogbit, from the, the firmware image, and will flash it. You could also download it to another partition, but I will show you just the use case where you're just directly flashing it. And then uh, SW update would check, uh, will check the, the firmware, checksum and signature if it's, if it has been signed. And if everything is fine, it will switch the bootloader to the green um, firmware partition. It will be a temporary switch and will reboot the system. At this point, we're starting to get an application downtime. When the system, well, a watchdog will get activated, and if everything runs fine, then when the application, when all the, the, the whole update has been successful and the application was fine, then the watchdog will be deactivated and the switch to the green firmware, to the new firmware, will be made persistent. Supposing that we got here, um, I don't know, download, the, an error in the download and we flash an erroneous firmware, then SW update would realize, okay, this, this version is wrong and would report back to Hogbit, okay, error in the update. So Hogbit would have the would show the error and the, the operator would have the op opportunity to retry or if there is an error in the in the um, firmware and the watchdog watchdog don't get the deactivated then the system would would switch back to the firmware version 1 again so it's, um, I think that um, it's a scenario that you have seen in some other presentations regarding firmware updates in this event, and you will probably see it again. It's the preferred scenario. Let's see another one. Um, if you don't have enough storage to have two firmware partitions, then you can get a lightweight Linux with SW update to do the updates. In this case, you will also avoid breaking your device. So your device should be always reachable from the backend, but there is no rollback possibility. The storage footprint is just one firmware, plus this partition that we didn't have in the previous case and the downtime is relatively long. We will see later when we see the, the whole process. And in this case, the only rescue when, when you flash an erroneous image is that you stay in a recovery model, modus from this, um, from this system. As I said previously, if you reduce your firmware, so typically this partition will be smaller than this one, but if you reduce your firmware, that match moving applications and as much as possible into these partitions, then in the end it could happen that they are almost equal um, big and then you could just take the two partitions strategy. Okay, so in this case, um, Hogbit, so 
in this firmware, we would need at least some functionality contacting Hogbit to get, uh, to get notified when some uh, updates are available. And the, the bootloader would be switched to this um, update partition and a reboot would be triggered. Then, well, at this point, our application downtime started. At this, okay, now we started already in, in our update partition, and this, uh, in this partition, SW update will start downloading the firmware image from Hotbit and flash over the previous existing firmware. In the end, SW update will check the, the checksum, the signature of the image, will switch temporarily to the firmware, and we will reboot. If everything runs fine, the firmware will deactivate the watchdog and will make this switch to the new firmware persistent. At this point, we have our application already up and running again. So as you can see, the downtime that we have in this case is much longer. Not only that, if at this point, if you're flashing nonsense, you don't have SW update would, would notice, okay, um, something is wrong with the image that I downloaded and flashed and wouldn't restart here. But nevertheless, you don't have any application running here, so your system is just in recovery modus, waiting to get a new working update. So these are the two um, extremes, in our opinion, in the IoT um, domain. There is, in SW update, there is a, another extreme to get less um, storage footprint, but in that case, it's a kind of um, SW update is kind of ragging the carpet from under its feet, so just with initRD and flashing <coughs> its own partition, and in that case you would you wouldn't get uh, any any recovery modules contacting the, the backend. So that's why, in our opinion, that's at least for us in in these IoT um, domains, it's too extreme. So, kind of getting to the end um, faster than expected. Um, as a conclusion, we got a 100% open source software solution up and running. Uh, we got into the communities. Uh, both communities welcome us. Um, we got contributions into SW update. We are working on getting contributions on Hogbit. They are both projects. The communities are happy to get involvement. And that was for us something important, not only getting open source software that you can modify and fix, but also getting into a community, an active community. And that was, in our opinion, a success. Um, currently, our focus is on um, firmware updates. But with these components, you can also get, in general, just software provisioning, applications, containers, many different scenarios. Although we use both of them, uh, this is a modular architecture. You can take Hogpit, you can take SW Update, and in both cases, you have different possibilities to connect them to other clients or other backends. So um, we were also happy to, to be into communities that can also that are active by themselves and that have their own lives and external other contributions. Mm -hmm. In the future, it could happen that we integrate other different backends or I don't know. So, and the future features that we are working on or hoping to see 
is the possibility of splitting um, the realization, the preparation of the update and the realization so that first the um, update gets, in the case of two partitions, for example, gets downloaded, flashed, but not activated in order to fit into maintenance windows. So devices that cannot be updated when they have, uh, when they get the firmware. That's one uh, feature we are working on. Um, and the other one is being able to synchronize the device and the backend so that you can, for example, update a device um, just with a USB stick, for example, because right now, Hockbit is expecting to be the source of truth. So when Hockbit says, okay, you device, you have version two, there is no way to convince Hockbit that that device got version three already. So um, that's another feature we are working on and um, we hope to get in the future also asymmetric key signatures. And that's it from my side. Any questions? We have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, you activate it. You, you activate a watchdog that you have to to keep alive. If you want, I mean, you can um, you have to reactivate the watchdog until you are sure, okay, everything is fine, and then you can deactivate it. You can have a short watchdog, and then during in the bootloader, activate it uh, when starting, activate it the application. So uh, refresh it, so restart the, the timeout, and in the end you would deactivate the watchdog. If in some, if so, the watchdog you say okay, a watchdog for I don't know, uh, thirty seconds. If your um, whole system can start in thirty seconds, then you perhaps you don't need those refreshes in between. But if let's suppose you say ten seconds, and your system needs. Um, half a minute to restart, kind of long, but um, then you would be refreshing the watchdog regularly so that it's not get triggered because the watchdog would reboot the system. So in, in Ubot you say that's something perhaps like, like hardware, the hardware, a hardware. So oh, a second. But you are talking about a, a kernel watchdog or a hardware watchdog. A hardware watchdog? Yes, I'm talking about a hardware watchdog and I would... So... Okay. But in the moment that you reboot that, if you have only one, you don't need that watchdog for the application because you are rebooting the application. So you can take that watchdog and use it for the whole update process and in the end, you would reuse it for your application. The moment your application is already up and running, would deactivate that watchdog, so to say, would uh, here. Uh, would deactivate the watchdog and make this switch to the partition persistent. And then you can use that watchdog. You already deactivated it. You can use it in your application your application, uh, but up to that point, your application is not running. You don't need that watchdog. Okay, then my question was more about making that change persistent. Do you, do you have um, some interfaces in Ubot to make that persistent? So we have some uh, steady in uh, so we say, okay, it's, um, I don't remember the status that we have, but based on steady, you know, okay, that uh, you would know, okay, it has been, um, are we in between of updating the system and something went wrong and I have to do a rollback or it's already persistent status and I can just boot normally?
certain state in your whole application stack, you say, okay, now I'm safe, keep the new version, and roll back possibly again, but if you were publicly released the update version, you may have a running system, but it's no longer an updatable system, hmm. and you're also lost. So this is something to decide about the application basis when you actually say, okay, everything is free, switch over and stay open. Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Sorry. Um. How do you, sorry? We just took a U bot. Just um, U bot is a um, flexible bootloader that we have in a lot of our products and we just, and U-Bot integrates pretty well with SW updates, so we just took U-Bot. Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. So um, typically you don't want to touch your bootloader. So you, you, um, you try not to update your bootloader. That's a tricky part to update. So if you can avoid it, you, you just get your U-boot and that's Booting your system and switching between the partitions, but um, that's it. It doesn't play any role. So it, Hogbit doesn't contact your bootloader directly or something like that. It's just SWU update is using some um, existing libraries from U-Bot to interact with U-Bot to make those switches. So it's a already existing interface being offered by U-Bot to interact with it. And SW update, I mean, they have been developed by the same company, so they play well with each other. <laughs> so you have to just use SW update to, to make the switch in the bootloader. You could also update your bootloader with SW update if you want. Uh, I think it's sorry. Okay, yeah, yeah. Can you define this route in, uh, uh, in the server? And the second question is okay, yeah. about the security. Do you have any security mechanisms to exchange the data between the two? Okay. Um, first question regarding the, um, the, rules. The, the rules, sorry. It's something that I didn't show here. Hogbit is has a specific single task. It's just making sure that a device gets an artifact that should be getting, but it doesn't offer those kind of filtering mechanisms. So Hogbit relies on a higher instance to decide, okay, this device should get this firmware or this artifact. So in Hogbit, you should use another let's say a device management system or another system, who knows, okay, this device can get this firmware. Hogbit doesn't know anything about different devices, different firmware. So Hogbit, if you say to Hogbit, flash this um, image for BeagleBone Black into a Raspberry Pi, we'll try to do it. Uh, there is no, no way you can use tags, but kind of that's for really small deployments, you can use the, the web UI and use tags, but it's not supposed to be used that way. The idea is that Hogbit, you just say to Hogbit, okay, Hogbit, I want to get this firmware into those devices. You can also, Hogbit has a mass rollout, so you can say, okay, try to start with five. 
If um, it works, then get up to 10. If everything is fine, then get up to 1,000 and everything, the, the rest of it. So that's the focus of Hogbit. And making sure, OK, um, this device should be getting this version. Had this device asked for any version in the later time, so kind of a heartbeat, uh, which version is this device reporting to have installed, and all this stuff is the focus from Hogbit, but no filtering possibility. And the second question was about the security in this communication, I imagine. OK, so you can um, secure HTTP in our case, but you could also use, in Hogbit, you have the possibility to, to connect adapters. To the, so you use um, message queue where you connect your adapters. So Bosch, for example, it's using co-op adapters for that. And then you would need on this side to extend Suricata probably to support those um, protocols. They are not supported right now, but it, uh, sorry, it has been written in such a way that you can easily extend it to support other protocols. And then you would take care, you can also use another communication channel where you take care of securing the communication. Yeah, and there, sorry. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, so you this if you if you use Hogbit to provide different uh, series of, of artifacts, and each one of them is a firmware update, then um, SW update would do an update, restart. Not really sure right now. So example, Perhaps, yeah? Example is I have a main, a main firmware with all the libraries and big stuff, and then the application firmware all, and other inmates use the graphics, for example. And so the state could be upgraded in any order because there are no, mm -hmm. no reference to send that uh, So what is uh, this system supposed to do? Um, on on Hogbit side, I mean there is you have in Hogbit you can pack um, many artifacts, but on SW update you also have the possibility to pack different updates together into one artifact. So depending on your scenario, I would say try to pack your um, so supposing you want to update a device with I don't know an FPGA and a firmware update and something else, and all the devices of this kind have the same updates, then I would pack everything into a single um, SW update um, binary blob. So update CPIO image, and then all the devices would be getting the same update. Uh, if you do it with Hogbit artifacts, I'm not sure right now how we implemented it. Uh, if it, if they are running in parallel or if it's sequentially. I cannot answer it right now. Uh, Hogbit doesn't offer. I think that it depends on the implementation on this side. So my question is, uh, how do you assess, how do you use this 
check at that flash. Check some. Yeah, of the of the whole partition. Okay. And that is built in on um, Suricata and Ofsys? In SW update. Oh, uh, yes. It's, it's uh, so it's it was already in a SW update before Suricata. <laughs> and No, uh, well, I didn't say we never update a bootloader. We try to avoid it. <laughs> um, we are trying in this project, we are trying to provide for Siemens um, framework, a stack based on open source software when possible. And so we don't have right now concrete scenarios where I can say, okay, we're updating the bootloader, but I would say in general you should try to avoid it if you can. If you can't, then you can use SW update. It's really flexible, it's powerful. You can update your bootloader if you want to, if you have to. It's possible, but I would recommend you not to do it if you don't need it. Not just to get fancy features. Dual bootloader, yeah. Yeah, good. That would be exactly uh, the right strategy if you need to update your, your bootloader, if you foresee that you need it. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, uh, let me. So it depends on how you define your, where you do what you mentioned as commit the update. So you have to decide what is for me a successful update. And at that point you commit that update. So it, for you, a right update, um, correct update has been finished where in, when your application starts and run some test and says, okay, everything is now fine, then that's the point to commit that update. It's a decision that you have to, to take. Checks. Yeah. It's exactly. so right now we didn't implement it, but you can do it. You can add into a SW update. You can extend it to to add this test, this kind of check, okay, let's check that I can contact the backend, uh, and that's, that's what you define as one of the criteria for a correct update. So you, you have to, to define it. So um, as far as I know, SW update doesn't check that right now. In any way, if it would, then uh, we would have to implement what should happen in that case. Um, refresh of the watchdog or what should happen in that case or communicate to another component or so it depends on the on the use case more question So uh, I will repeat the answer. So that was uh, Stefano Babic, the main, uh, the maintainer and main contributor of uh, SW Update, that um, you can use post in uh, scripts to do that.
Okay? That's it? Thank you.